Brass, 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 brass. Stop. Now make that mother effer hammer time. Brass is an alloy or a substance that combines more than one metal or mixes a metal with some other non-metallic element. For example, brass is an alloy of two metals, copper and zinc. Steel is an alloy of a metallic element, iron, and a small amount of a non-metallic element, carbon. I'm Professor Grimm. Welcome to class, students. Today we're talking that brass. Maybe not super popular, but definitely an interesting material in some modern knives. And our science today is an attempt to patina this material. That's why we've assembled in the lab here today. This is an extra credit class, not necessarily attached to our main curriculum. You can find those classes in the uh, TSA Knives channel history. Over there, we're exploring all things sharp and pointy with a scientific eye. This course is more of an offshoot, a wild tangent, a type of fever dream fueled by accidentally huffing too much ammonia. As a side note, please don't do that when we get to that part of the class. Seriously, thank you. But do like and subscribe to Stay in School students. Us nerds, we rule the world. We're sending people to the moon and stuff again. Let's begin. Like breeding a German Shepherd, we'll name them Zinc, with a wiener dog that we've named Copper. The offspring of these two will contain a mixture of the characteristics of its parent. Zinc is pretty boring shit. It's gray, silvery, slightly brittle metal. Its real claim to fame is in being a trace element in us who-mans. And that an estimated two billion who-mans around the world suffer from zinc deficiency, leading to a laundry list of health issues like diarrhea. Zinc is delicious and non-ferrous, which will be important later. Copper is the real star of the show here. Us Humans have loved it since 8,000 BC. And besides its sort of obvious showstopper uses in electrical wiring and plumbing, we also seem to have a style renaissance every hundred years or so of using copper and its various alloys like brass and bronze for its aesthetic appeal. It's not totally uncommon to see a copper roof in a particularly hip coffee shop, or you can just look at our lovely Statue of Liberty, the Copper Lady. We just can't seem to get enough of its weird orangish red coloration, at least in its raw form. You might also see cabinet drawers or door handles that are made purely of copper. And it's actually pretty dang smart, not just for how it looks, but also because copper is naturally antimicrobial. In fact, some research suggests that we knew of the antimicrobial properties of copper before we even had germ theory or knew what microbes actually are. In the long, long ago, it was advised to make fresh water pots out of copper instead of contemporary competitors like clay, because it was noted that the copper pots had remarkably less biofilm develop on the surface of the water over time. It's not just that microbes don't like or simply won't grow on copper. The copper actually attacks the integrity of the membrane or the shell of the microbe and kills them. During a recent uh, scare of the entire planet due to microscopic thingies, there were several places with a shortage of copper to make doorknobs and bathroom fixtures. I'm just saying, it works. And that's a pretty clever way to keep a germ-free knife. Copper, like zinc, is non-ferrous, meaning brass overall is non-ferrous. But it is conductive, and magnetism and electricity are two sides of the same coin, aka electromagnetism. That means copper is subjected to Faraday's law of induction and Lenz's law. Basically, moving a magnetic field near copper induces a flow of electrical current, 
And then that flowing current itself puts off a temporary magnetic field. And that magnetic field gets stronger the faster the magnet moves near it. I'll show you some examples. I have a magnet that I've attached to a piece of shoestring here. And these are copper plates. The magnet is not attracted to it like it would be to iron. But if I suspend it and make a pendulum, it's not touching, and swing it, you can see that it actually stops the magnet. And this is how air brakes on a roller coaster will work. Two magnets this time, a circular one that I'll sit on top here, and my air brake one. Interesting here is you could actually make this float if you're skilled. Maybe if I flip it over. So close. It's so close. But what is weird is even if I move the copper out of the way, you can see the copper that's slowing it down. Fascinating stuff. Weird. And not at all applicable to knives. Copper, and by extension brass, are also fairly soft and have a unique medium to high friction coefficient, meaning that without lubrication, the friction between brass and another material, let's say steel, is higher than one might have if they enjoy other knives that say have a ball bearing pivot. So with brass, the friction is high, but smooth, and it never peaks or valleys into anything perceivable during use. This is why brass washers are actually somewhat popular on modern knives. If this was my blade, a classic slip joint is usually just tensioned or squeezed between materials to adjust the friction to a user's liking, either really loose or really tight and annoying. Other knives have almost no tension, allowing the blade to flip open with the slightest flipping motion. The brass or bronze fitting is the Goldilocks zone between these two extremes. And it's hard to describe, but the smooth, even pressure feeling during opening is more like a hydraulic, slow, or even a resistant scraping against the surface of the copper plate. They aren't necessarily related to the magnet things we did, but it, it does feel a little bit like an air brake on a roller coaster. We are about halfway through our class, so let's take a break and we'll meet back up in a few minutes with our experiment ready to go. Hello again, class. Glad to see you all made it back. It's patina time. The lab is nice and open with good ventilation. Make sure you have something like that if you're gonna try this yourself. Oxidization of metal is a type of corrosion. It's an ionic chemical reaction of the oxygen present at the surface of the material. In a lot of metals, this is a bad thing. Iron, for example, can pretty much rust or corrode into dust. It will lose all of its structural integrity over time. But that's not true of copper, which protects itself. Uh, it forms an additional corrosive layer under your patina. Basically, this is an experiment that I'm not too worried about screwing up because the patina will really only be a few atoms deep. Worst case scenario, we can use some very fine grit sandpaper to just scrub off uh, whatever weird colors we get and start over, which is fortunate because there's an infinite number of techniques to get the type of patina we want. And I've settled on just one of them to try out for you on my Clyde. We are going to make a vapor chamber. That's simply a chamber that creates and traps vapors, in this case, ammonia vapors. The chamber itself is just a piece of Tupperware. It's clear so that we can see the reaction of the brass inside of it. We need ammonia, a really pungent cleaning agent. Uh, ammonia really does not want to be a liquid at room temperature and at Earth's atmospheric pressure. 
We make these plastic bottles and mix it with water to slow down the reaction. But as soon as we open the cap, rapid evaporation allows the ammonia to escape the confines of its water prison and turn into a gas. Hence, the awful smell. We need paper towels for cleaning our whoopsies and assisting the evaporation of our ammonia by increasing the surface area of the liquid ammonia exposed to the atmosphere. This is why, if you've watched any of this type of video, people don't pour ammonia into the tub alone. They crumple up and set paper towels into the vapor chamber and lightly wet them with the ammonia. Imagine if we could unfold and lay all of these paper towels flat. Every strand of them, every nook and cranny in their textured, grippy design. If we could actually visualize this unfolded, the surface area of it would be enormous compared to the top layer of the liquid in our ammonia chamber. That exposure allows more fumes to be generated. We have salt. Any salt will do. Again, some people don't use it, which is whatever. Remember, this is just one of many recipes. I am also going to use some yellow ochre. Yellow ochre is a paint pigment made of natural clay and ferric oxide. Just for fun. You don't need that if you don't want to, whatever. I'm hoping for some interesting yellow colors uh, in my patina. And again, worst case scenario, We'll just try over. I also have a little spray bottle of water. This is to help our salt adhere to the brass and to pool together into water droplets that I hope will kind of reflect what I imagine a shipwreck looking patina to be like. We have our brass scales. I'm going to wear rubber gloves because my body is disgusting and shameful and also to prevent oils from my hands getting onto the brass and then showing up later in the patina. I'm going to use some rubbing alcohol to clean the brass up. Then I'll take a scratch pad to lightly scuff the brass and expose new material to the I have my vapor chamber and I have some paper towels that are just set into here. I'm not mashing them down into tight little balls. I'm making sure that they are stayed ruffled up and then just setting them down into the bottom of the chamber. I made a little metal rack just to suspend my scales over the paper towels. And so hopefully we can see the reaction. Now I'm gonna spray them with a little bit of water. This is just to make sure that the salt adheres. And then I'm doing a little bit of the yellow ochre, but you don't. I also happen to have a couple of pure copper blanks here that I'm gonna put in with some different recipes to see how they look. I think that this one I'll just leave alone. I won't put anything on it. This one I might do a little bit of water. This one I'll do some water and some salt. This one, water.
just to see what happens. And then I'm gonna put a lid on it and leave it alone. And we'll revisit in around two hours. People will leave these for up to 48 hours, but uh, it really shouldn't take that long for the reaction. truth and look at that oh my god that is right that is right our copper is pretty boring but our brass looks real sick already uh, some people aren't gonna do the next part that i want to do which is I'm gonna submerge it in water and wipe some of this off Real patina should stay, but anything that is just like dyed, like this yellow color here, might come off. I'm willing to risk it because worst case scenario, I won't do anything. A little bit. And rub some of this off. Shipwreck patina on brass. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let these dry and then I'm going to spray them with some clear coat enamel. I'll probably do one or two layers, but I'm going to save you that part of watching acrylic clear coat dry because we are done here. Thank you so much for watching. Once I have this all back together and coated and done, uh, I'll send out a blog post or something to let everybody see it.